Hello, everyone. Um, so my name is Martin, as you probably heard. And I will be today telling you something about data-driven forums and something about data-driven approach when you are trying to generate some piece of UI from some, some data, right? Um, I should probably introduce myself. I work here at Red Hat in Brno uh, for almost three years now. I started working as a UI developer from the start. The first project I was working on is CloudForms, and then a lot of people from CloudForms moved to the Insights, which is now called cloud.redhead.com, or cloud services, or whatever you want to call it. Um, I've been developing UI for as long as I can remember. Um, I think the first pieces of code that I've written at high school were just some you know, simple JavaScript applications for some projects. And honestly, at that time, I re really didn't like the UI, and mostly because of the JavaScript, because I felt that the language was really, really clunky, like the prototyping instead of classes. That was just completely insane for me, because I also used to write you know, Java code. And in Java, every, every classes and everything is really nice. You know, you've got all these interfaces and types and stuff like that. And then you write something like that in JavaScript, and you just can't believe what's going on there. But you know that mostly changed when the ES6 specification came. I felt like that the language really grown a lot, and the syntax especially was much more, you know, Java-like, I guess, which really interested me. And I know it's not that true, but at that time I really believed that. And also the movement towards the functional programming was really you know, a big thing for me because I personally believe that's the way to go. Um, so maybe something you know, about my personal life. I love dogs. Um, I just recently bought a flat. So I got a mortgage for 30 years. So if somebody wants to sponsor me, you can just go ahead. Um, yeah, and that's about it. That's about myself. And let's move to our, something we call data driven forms. So data driven forms is a React library that we have written. Uh, I will be talking about it, but that doesn't mean that you can't you know, apply these rules you know, and the approach to other languages or libraries or whatever. We try to design this library to be designed for UI and for components, not for React and not for specific project. So uh, what's it all about? I'll just stop working. <laughs> Great. So what's it all about? Uh, data Drum Forums is a React component which takes a JSON input and renders a form from that. It takes care of all about of all the form state management. It does validations. Synchronous, asynchronous, it depends what you want to use. You've got some conditional fields. Uh, you've got you know, data types in typecasting. As you probably know, that you know, in HTML forms, everything is string, except for checkboxes. So you need that for your APIs. We also design it to, to be design system independent. Uh, so that means that you can use any component library you want, really. We are using mostly Parmfly three and four, but you know, if you're using something else, you can do that also. All the components are fully customizable, and you are not locked down to just a specific set of components. Like if you need some very strange component just for that one form, you can just develop it, you know, register it into the, into the uh, form render and use it. Uh, so that's a you know, quick summary of data driven forms is. But I would like you to explain why did we even decide to create a library like this. It's not the only one out there. There are other libraries that do the practically the same thing that we found out that there are some limitations and issues with them. So we did not use them. So why would you even try to use like data to an approach? Why would you generate your UI from some data? Why wouldn't you just write it down? Well, in, in small-scale projects, that doesn't really make sense. I mean, if you have an application with four pages, you will spend more time you know, developing some of these tools rather than you just sit down and write, write the markup and write the logic. 
But you know, when the scale is growing, when you have, for instance, hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of forms, like we did in cloud forms, you know, doing everything manually is not really that easy, right? So if you have some data-driven approach, UI is more stable, you can maintain it, you test it only one place, you know that with the same input, you will always get the same result. You don't have to worry about some strange side effect and stuff like that. Uh, one thing that I should mention, we did not develop a state management library. We are using React Final Form to take care of the state management. Uh, we did not feel that this is necessary. I mean, it's a very good library. It suited our needs. And again, if you are using something else in your applications and you would like to use data driven forms, like you can easily take all of these ideas and approaches and just apply them to your specific desktop. You don't even have to use React. Right? So there was the question, so why did we develop this? So we had this use case, right? Uh, you know, manager came and said, we need to generate forms from some data. Uh, we don't, we will have dynamic forms based on some parameters. You will send something to API and it will send you some data. You have to render it, right? We also, that's for the cloud services, right? In cloud forms, there was also the issues that we have hundreds of forms. They were not tested. You know, everything was behaving completely differently and we needed to fix that. And there was the another, another issue that we will have to migrate from Paranfly 3 to Paranfly 4. If you don't know what Paranfly is, Paranfly is, is a design system used, used in Red Hat in all their web applications. And we have two versions right now, 3 and 4. The 3, Paranfly 3 is based on boots, um, Bootstrap and the Paranfly 4 has been built from ground up. And eventually every application should probably migrate to the latest version. So obviously the first thing I did, I went on the internet and I written data to forms in, in the search. And I get a lot of results, you know, libraries like React Apollo or React JSON Schema or SQL, even <laughs> some library for generating forms from SQL, which I found kind of strange, but it's okay. We specifically used in the cloud services the Open API. If you don't know what an API is, Open API is basically specifications for APIs. It defines the endpoints. You can use it for generate some clients, documentations, and stuff like that. And you know, after uh, like a couple of days, one of our backend guys came and he said, "Hey, there's this library, React JSON Schema Form, and it can generate forms from the Open API schema." And I was like, "Great, you know, work is finished, everything is fine." But as it turned out, it really, really wasn't. So generating UI from data isn't you know, anything new. Like there's a lo lot of lot of libraries out there. Even if you have ever written some list that is generated from your API response, you are basically did you know data do an approach. So why why create another one? I will try to exp explain this using GraphQL example and using the libraries that I listed. All these libraries have one similarity and that is they are not developed for UI. They are, you, they are backend technologies, all of them. And they are used to specify you know, entities, tables, you know, APIs, endpoints, whatever. But the thing is, none of them consider the same use cases, the same you know, uh, attributes or other stuff that you have to consider when you are developing UI. You know, when you have your API endpoint and you expect a string, you expect a string. If something else comes, you just throw an error. Like if, if the backend developers are nice and kind, you will get you know, 400 response by the request. If they don't care about the stuff, they will just let the server blow up and you get 500. Right? That's not good enough for the UI. And even GraphQL, which was built specifically for UI because Facebook had issues with their mobile versions of, fa of the Facebook app, it's still not good enough because it's still a specification for an API. It's a query language. It doesn't consider all the stuff that you have to consider when you are building UI. Right? So I will try to, oh, by the way, I'm not trying to say that you should not use these things. I, I, I think that for a lot of you, you know, libraries like the Apollo GraphQL forms would be enough. The issue will be apparent when you have when you have some complex UX and when you get some strange tasks 
from the customers that they will specifically tell you, I need this, like this is not standard. And all of these libraries are not very well prepared for that. So let me show you an example. And we, as I said, we did use OpenAPI, but I think the example using GraphQL is much more, uh, it's much better because the limitations of the GraphQL language are even, when it comes to the generating UI, are, are even bigger than OpenAPI. So this is your standard, you know, GraphQL entity specification. It's just a simple user. You've got four attributes, name, age, city, etc. And if you look at this, you know, and if backend, backend guys come to you, hey, this is an entity, we need form for this, and generate this, please. You just look at it, okay, string, that's going to be text input, integer, that's going to be number input, city, text, etc., etc. So you do your job, you know, you create a form, you send it to Jira or Trello, whatever you are using, you mark it as done, and you move on with your day. Well, then the UX comes in. They look at a screenshot and they say, but the bio thing, like that has to be an text array. I say, okay, that sounds reasonable. So how do I do this? I've got this entity. API has been using it for months. Like they have it clearly defined. What do I do about it? The database stores it as exactly the same field, like it's var hard two five five, whatever. But the UX said that it has to be an text array because they would want it that way and it's reasonable. So we say, okay, well, how do I do this? Well, for GraphQL, I have to create another type because that's the only thing that differentiates these things, right? So I create another type bio, and I know that every time I get a bio type, I will have to render text around. And then you get another request. Uh, the age, that's going to be input type range. Why? Oh, don't ask me, I mean, I would never do that. And add another, another field with your kids, and it's not an integer. So you write back to the UX person, and you tell him this is completely stupid, like why would age field be a range? Why would it be a slider? And the response will be, well, the user is going to pay us 10 billion billion dollars and give us dogs. And we all love dogs, so you are going to do that, obviously. So you create another type of age, and if something is going to be type of age, you will render an into type of range. And then they will need an enum for the city. And that's actually reasonable. You don't want to just, you just pick from the selection. Why not? And then the backend guy comes to work and he sees what you did to the GraphQL specification. And it breaks absolutely everything, right? Tests are gone, you know, they're <laughs> QA, they are just, everything is on fire. Like you, ca you can't do that, by the way. You can't just change your models, you know, your database tables and you know, tell them, well, I need this to render the UI. Right? This is not a good idea. This is going to break everything. So you get in a huge fight, you know, and you start shouting at each other. And in the middle of that great conversation, the UX comes again. And they will tell you, I need this to be a wizard. And on the first step, they will be name and kids. Second step, the rest. And the first step, there will be a nice summary with a crazy video of a guy riding a bicycle. How the hell am I supposed to generate that from the GraphQL or, or type? This is how you feel about it. So what, what was the problem here? And I can tell you that with the open API, it's slightly, slightly easier because you, know, you get stuff like titles and you get stuff like you know, if the field is read only and whatnot, you can even hide. There are, there are even some attributes which tell you to hide some fields. But at the end of the day, you will have the same issue. So why do you have this issue? Well, look at, look at, let's look at the bio field, for instance, right? From the UI perspective, there is nothing that tells you what to render and how to use it. The only thing that is clear is the name of that field and based on the excla exclamation mark that it's required. And what are the another, you know, attributes, what about labels, what about placeholders, you know, what about the validation message, how am I supposed to store all of these things into just a simple data type, into just a simple string, 
And the question, uh, then the answer to that is you don't. By creating new types, that doesn't work. We are going to break everything. And you can argue, well, we will create a second schema just for the UI. Well, why would you use GraphQL specification for that then? What's the point of that? So, <laughs> another thing is you might have an API which is consumed by uh, 10 different UIs and every single UI is using different design system and different wording and some are translated, some are not. So you can't really justify using backend technologies to render front end, right? I put a slide here, maybe some of you won't agree with me, but personally I feel that if you wanna sell something, some web application, you better have some pretty good darn UX. Because that's going, that, that is what's going to sell that thing, right? Not the features, like nobody cares about the features anymore, <laughs> I feel like. <laughs> uh, take for instance Trello, right? Everybody knows Trello, uh, it's a nice, you know, task management system or Kanban system, whatever you want to call it. But at its core, it's just a few lists and you drag and drop stuff between that, and that's it. Like, yes, yeah, so you, can, you can add tags and dates, but there are many, many other you know, management, task management systems which are much more complex and can do much more things. But nobody uses them because everybody's using Trello because everybody can use Trello. You just you know, sit a guy in front of the computer, you know, open the Trello page, and he'll be like master of task management in five minutes because it's so simple to use, and the UX is great. But you know, this wasn't good enough for us. We needed some, gener some UI generation and, and something for these forums. We couldn't <coughs> write them manually because we didn't, <laughs> but the use case was specific. You will get some payload and you will have to render, render that from the, uh, from the payload. And also we had some legacy project which has, as I said, hundreds and hundreds of forums and doing that manually. Like we, at, at, that time, at that point, we were behind several years of migrating them to new technologies. And nobody wants to code forms. I mean, let's be honest, like forms are boring. Uh, every form, you know, every form behaves basically the same way. So why would data-driven forms be any different? Well, the first difference is that the data-driven forms, as I said, were designed from ground up with UI in mind. And not just UI, but also components. We did not focus on any specific library, we didn't focus you know, on any specific applications. And after some iterations, these are basically the main rules that I kind of came up with when trying to write the library from the ground up. And the first rule that I am personally you know, very well acquainted with is do not limit the developer. Like if the UX sent you some if the UX designer will send you some crazy, crazy looking UI, you have to be able to do that, right? You can't just tell them I can't do that because the library that I'm using doesn't allow me to do it. And that's not going to be good enough, right? They did a lot of research and you know, they designed it. They know that the customers wants, the customer wants it that way. So you have to be able to do that. The second thing is when you have the schema and it kind of depends on the, fir the first rule, the schema has to be open because the UI will change. Like you can have two forums with same fields, but the fields can be completely different. You can use completely different components with completely different attributes. So you can't be just locked down to a set of, I don't know, 50 attributes that you can use for your components. But at, same, at the same time, the schema has to be also defined. If you will just design something that, that has no you know, rules and limitation, eventually that's going to break and you will end up in the same place you know, as if you would when you would be writing all these code, all these UIs, and all these forms manually. And the third rule is don't lock the user or the, uh, the developer to just one design system. That, that comes back to what I said earlier, we are using Panelfly 3 and 4 and we want to migrate to Panelfly 4. So obviously we need this flexibility to, to do this. So after we had this you know, rules, let's say, we needed some you know, main building blocks of the library. 
So obviously we want to render something from data, so we have to somehow speci specify the schema. In order to let the developers to create some new components and customize them, we came up with something called component mapping. I will get to later. And then we, there is this form render itself, which basically takes the schema and the, and the components and then renders the UI. So let's look at this, these things separately. So this is a very, very basic example of the schema. It's always an object and there has to always be in fields array. And every single object in the fields array is the component. So first thing is the name. I mean, if you have input with some name in a form, you have to have it somewhere. And then there's the component field. I mean, the component field exactly defines what kind of component, component you are going to use. In this case, it's a text field. It can be select, it can be wizard, it can be tabs, checkboxes, or whatever other component that you have at, at your disposal. And compared to the GraphQL, for instance, there was just a string. There is just this type string, and I'm supposed to guess from that type everything that I need to know. Well, we decided, I mean, it's nice that we know that the type is string, but it doesn't help us in the UI. Everything is string and forms, so we will just use this definition of the component. And this constant will always pick or define the correct component I have to use. There is no ambiguity, nothing like that. And then you start adding stuff. There's label, text color, full width. But at its core, all of these other special stuff, they are just component props from React. Right. And now you might say, well, which props I'm supposed to use? How do I know that my component uses label instead of, instead of title? And these props and these attributes name are picked specifically from the component. Your component API defines how the field or how the schema looks. If your component uses label props, label prop, you can add this key. If your component uses options prop, you will add the options key with the correct value. And this is, I believe, that how we achieved that the schema is open, but and yet at the same time is defined. I mean, if you take a Red Hat, for instance, every UI developer knows, or at least should know, pattern fly. And if they know pattern fly, they can look at the schema and they can instantly say what kind of component it is and what kind of props it has and how it will look and how, we, how it will behave. So even though that the schema is fairly open, every single developer in Red Hat will know what kind of UI will be rendered and what it will do. And, uh, and that applies to you know, any other company that has some design system and that has some component libraries, right? So then there is the form renderer. The form renderer is basically just a big rendering loop that goes through that goes through the schema. It also hooks the components to the form state, if you want it to be to hook to the component state. Uh, it goes through the it goes through the schema. It picks the components. It adds some necessary props, you know, like your own change functions, your own blur functions. It adds some metadata to it, you know. It, it the, is the field valid? Is it not? Is there some error message? Did the user touch it? Is it active? All these good things come from the React Final Form library, and I guess that the other libraries have some equivalence to it. And once the component is put together, it just renders it to the UI. But on its own, the form renderer doesn't really know anything about the components it's supposed to render, right? If you try to just you know, use the schema, pass it to the renderer, it would just crash because it has no idea how to, how to render them. Now that is taken care of by the component mapping. The component ma mapping itself, these are just you know, objects and each key or each value in that object has a key and a value obviously and the key has the same, has the same constant that you use for the component field, right? So if you have a text field in your schema, you must have a text field key in your component mappers. And based and you know, value of that component component mapper is 
React component. And that's all the limitations you have. Right? If you want to use your application as a field in the if you want to use your application as a field in the form, you can do that. I mean, we don't restrict you to any component sets, you know, or component types. You will use whatever you need to use. You will use whatever you are using right now in your application and just register it under some name. So right now there are two component mappers. Um, actually, we kind of decided that in next major version version of the library there is going to be only one. Mm -hmm. For some reason, we decided to split two layout mappers and form fields mappers. But as it turned out, it doesn't really make sense. There is no reason why you should split these things. So, but right now, there is a layout mapper. And in layout mapper, you will use your static you know, components for the forms. For instance, the whole form wrapper, or basically just a form tag in your HTML. Buttons, we have some for groups and stuff like that. We had even more before, but you know, as we were developing and using it and iterating, we kind of discovered that you don't really need that much. And basically, you don't even need these buttons. You, know, you can render them on your own. The only thing from the layout mapper that you <laughs> really need right now is the form tag. Well, and then there's the form form themes mapper. It yeah, does the implementation for your inputs, for your checkboxes, selects, etc. So this is how the component mapper looks like. I will be using the text field example. And as you can see, it's just a simple impl implementation of React component. And down there is a form fields mapper. It's just a text field. The, it's just a constant of text field. And there is the value of that component. And this is how it kind of works. And I will show speci this specific example in a minute. I will do some coding. You take the component mappers, you take the schemas, you put it into renderer, the renderer picks all the stuff it needs, it will connect the field to the state, it will pass the props to it, and then this render. So let's give you some examples. Um, hopefully everything will work. I will show you some basic code that you can do. And we'll, what you would probably do when you would start you know, writing with data drum forms, and then I will show you some more complex stuff that we are using right now in our applications on cloud services. So I will move the stuff to there. There's some code. There's this. So you use this. So I created completely empty project which has been bootstrapped with the create react app from facebook as you can see there's nothing special about this just the empty project i did pre-install the dependencies i did pre-install the data drum forms and also material ui because i didn't want you to wait for it so let's just start uh, there is a lot of useless stuff that we don't need at this moment. I will just delete all of this and delete all of this. We don't need this. And also delete all of this and all of this. Great. This is all that we need. Let's start it. And there is an empty React application. Uh, by the way, I think it's very too small. Um, oops. oops. Yeah, it seems to be right. So you would start as with any library in React, you would just import then from React Commander. And I will use our amazing documentation. And we start to create some layout mappers. So as I said, in layout mappers, there are right now just fine predefined component types, form wrapper buttons, title, and stuff like that. We'll just create two of them. 
I will copy these constants. Oh, I will go there. Edit my components. So to create just the form wrapper, all you really need is just some form tag. children to it. Oops. And we will pass the props. So in these props you will basically just find the handle submit function or on submit rather. And obviously the children of the form. I will now prepare the button which has a label. It has a variant. And there's some other stuff. Mostly, you know, again, the handle submit, some types, etc., etc. So it's just going to be normal button with label. And let's give it some styling. It's going to be very basic. Oops. Let's give it a background. I am this primary is going to be red, otherwise it's going to be initial. Mm. It's going to be very pretty. There you go. Can you see it? No. Yeah. Well, you can't really see that, but it doesn't really matter. I don't know what is this. And for the rest of the stuff, they are just containers for some various pieces. So we'll just use fragment for that. Obviously, if you would ever use it in your application, you would probably want to style the thing. So let's now use the form render. Oops. Let's give it the layout mapper. And we don't have any schema. Right now it will probably fail if I try to run it. Oh yeah, you get a nice error that you are missing a schema. So let's create the schema. We need a fields array. And in that fields array we will create a text field. Oops. Let's call it first name. And we'll use the component of text field. We don't need any other props right now. We'll just add label. Why not? Let's pass the schema to the form and let's give it some on submit function. Just come the lock is good enough for now. And now it's going to crash because we don't have any form fields mapper so let's create that and right now it's just going to be an empty because we don't have any form components defined so this would be the basic setup you would need to start but obviously we are missing the components to render oh, there it is. Uh, and I seem to miss oops there it is layout mapper form fields mapper I probably some typos but oops Yes, so now it's telling me that I'm trying to render text field component, but there isn't any. So 
let's implement that. And I'm going to create some very simple example and then I will going to show you if you have an existing design system, how easy it is to actually reuse it. So let's create a text field. It will get two new props that you don't specify in, in the schema, and those are input and meta. And in the input prop, you will get your onChange, you will get your value, you will get your on blur focus, and stuff like that. Basically, the things that will change the form state. And in the meta attribute, you will get your error message, you will get your other meta tags, like if the field is valid, etc. And then you will get anything that you want. So let's say our text field is going to have label. Let's say it's going to have placeholder. Let's say it's going to have helper texts. Helper text. And let's say that we want it to be required. There we go. You can see it. So let's create that input field. It's going to be a diff. Let's give it some style. Um, let's make it flex because why not? And make it in a column. Okay. So now let's do the label. And we will use label. HTML for oops for input dot name. Now let's use the let's actually define the input. And maybe a good thing would be to have a type of that input. Let's give it all the input props that we get from the form state. Let's give it the type. And let's give it a placeholder. I got the mistake here. And then let's use, if we have some helper text, let's give it another spam with the helper text. There it is. So I just defined a very basic component. And I will now take the constant of that component, give it to the form fields mapper, Oops. and use the component as a value. And it's there. And suddenly it's rendered. So uh, let's also give some state so you can actually see what you have written inside of that thing. Oops. Oops. Mistake. And give it some format. And give it an empty. So that stringify values now two. And whenever we submit the values, we will just set them to our state. So I can now type my name inside of here, and I will get it in the form state. So this is the output. Well, this is a very basic example. Um, let's say that we want to add some validation. So required validation is good enough for this example, I think. Let's get the required validator. I will just copy and paste it from the docs. And use this. And I also added the required prop in our text field. Now, one, in, one important thing to mention, like this validate field only does the validation. It doesn't change the look of that component. So if you want to add, you know, some asterisks and stuff like that, you will have to specify that specifically for that component. Now, the reason why we did this is that we didn't want to go through all the validators and then some create some magic attribute. 
because a lot of you know, material UI, for instance, uses required. You know, pattern fly uses is required, and your different component can use different type of flag for that. And we have a lot of different validations, like for maximum and minimum length. We have validation for regex URLs, etc. So going through, you know, go going through all these validations and coming up with different attributes and kind of guessing what kind of attributes your component are using is not really an option. So this is another thing that we didn't want to dictate the APIs of your component. You will just use your own things. So my field is now required. If I save this and if I try to submit it, you see that nothing happens, but only the field gets focused. I would also probably want to see the validation message of that, com uh, uh, of that error. So the validation message is hidden in the meta tag. So if there is an error, I will use new element, oops, which will render that error message. I messed something up. Yeah, I did. I'm supposed to use this. So, mm, it doesn't work for some reason. I don't know why. Can somebody see the issue? I don't. Oh, I'm not gonna get bothered with that right now because I don't wanna debug it. It's probably something. Where? No, no, no. It should be in the meta object. Yeah. Oh, there is an error. There is a big error. Oops. So let's console log that meta attribute. That's it. That is the error message. I don't know why it's not showing up. You see it here. <laughs> oh gee. Oh yeah. This is this is why live demos are the best always. Well Oh, it is. <laughs> <laughs> it works after all. So there it is. You've got your validation. Uh, this is very ugly. You wouldn't really want to use that anywhere. So I pre-installed a material UI to showcase how easy it is to use existing components in your component mappers. React core, text field. So, for the material UI, well, we don't need any of this. We can just delete it and just use the text field. We will give it the input props. We will give it label. We will give it no, error required. Oops. Should we use the required? And type. Why not? Oh, and suddenly there's material UI input, which works exactly the same. If I use a helper text, I can give it a helper text or use the meta error to render. So this is how it works. You can see if you have already predefined components, it's very simple. And you don't really have to do that much coding. You just have to you know, connect this component to the form state. So rather than just showing you these simple examples, I will just move on 
towards something that we are using right now in the cloud services. So this is a sources page. Basically what this means, you use some cloud, ser cloud services provider like Amazon and OpenShift. You connect it to your, um, you connect it to your tenant or group or whatever. And you can then order some stuff, you can monitor it, etc. It's, it's not really that important for this showcase. I click wrong button. So when you want to add a new source, you are going to be shown this wizard. And everything is this wizard is done via data driven forms. So let's look at some of the features. So then now you have some page. You can sh choose your application for which you want to use this source. So let's say I want to do catalog and only available source type for catalog is Ansible Tower. Okay then, let's go to the next step. You need to add some name, you need to add some password, and you can see that if the, this you know, subform is not valid, you can't move to the next page or next step, you can't click to the next step. So let's give it some, something else. You can do some more parameters, you know, URLs, etc. Well, this is not a URL. I can't go somewhere else. Well, I guess we'll have to give it something else. Whatever. It's still not URL. Well, let's use this thing. So the validation is quite solid. And you know, valid for validation, you can use asynchronous validation. You can use custom functions, whatever you need. You can you've got now this nice summary page. You can go back. You can choose the you know different applications you want you you want to use. You know, everything you have to you know everything is remembered. You can also say that you know whatever the field is gone from the from the DOM, you can delete all stuff. And you can imagine there's actually quite a lot of logic you know, behind this component. And, you know, anytime you know you want to use wizard, you don't have to write anything. You just have to write, okay, I want these components to be in this step. I want these validations, you know, and when I select the type to be X, I want to go this route or I want to go another route. So this is kind of nice, it's a nice example. The another one I can show you is how does it work with dynamic data fetching. Where's my goes? There it is. So in different application in catalog, you can run playbooks from Ansible Tower. Uh, if you don't know what that means, you have basically some scenario somewhere written that will tell you, I want to install you know, new operating system and I want to use 10 CPUs for that and I want it to run you know, every five minutes or whatever. And it seems that the site is down, which is amazing. As always, live demos are the best. There it is. So how we do that, so you can you know, create these groups of items inside a catalog. You say, I want to have these job template, the job templates. And based on that job, job templates, when you want to run that thing, you will get a form and the site is down again. Uh, so the connection is really slow. Or the connection is really slow. Well, how, how does it basically works is that you send a request to a server. It will send you the schema and from that schema you are going to render it. There are also another features like you can take that schema, you can modify it inside the application. You know, you can change your validation messages, you can change your names, labels, etc. And you can customize it to your needs. Like for one user, you want to show just half of the attributes because you don't want them to customize the number of CPUs because that's going to cost a lot of money. You want them, you know, to customize maybe just, you know, the times when the playbook is supposed to run and stuff like that. And you can see right now doing that manually is not really possible. You kind of need some sort of engine with which will render these UIs for you. Well, I was kind of hoping that I could show, show that to you, but I guess I won't. Uh, can you stick to the Ethernet? Well, you have to be connected to VPN and stuff like that, but I don't think that this might not work. Ooh. 
something is happening. Network changed. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I don't want to get bogged down with this stuff. So you're going to have to just take my word for it. It works. And that's about it. Um, I would like to thank you for it, your attention. If you are interested in the data journal forms, there are some contacts you can use. Definitely check out the GitHub repo. Uh, we are always looking for some help. You can check out the docs. And if you need to get in co contact with me specifically, you can use the email or I'm always at the Gitra. Well, always when I'm not sleeping. So you can contact me there. And if you have any questions, just go ahead and I would love to answer them. Please. Um, yeah, so the question was if I have any links to the examples that I was showing at uh, this thing, you mean? So we have examples for all the components that we use at the data gen forums documentation. So if you want to see a wizard, you will just see a wizard. Well, if the connection actually works. But we don't have specific examples, you know, to these components because obviously they are used in the cloud services, in the cloud services application. So I think there are some pictures. Yeah, you can try it out over here. You can see some of the schemas for the wizard. I think there are even some pictures here. Yes, I think this is taken directly for the cloud services. So most of the stuff that I was showing you here today is taken from our documentation. So if you want to check that out, you can go through it. You will find a lot of you know, cool stuff there. <laughs> Anybody else? So the benefit of the libraries in being able to generate a schema from data? Because if you write the schema by hand, then it's just, you can just write the JSX. Yes, so. The, yes, so the question was, the reason of this library is that you can generate a schema and if you need to write it manually, there is you know, no point of doing that, just writing the JSX. That's a very good point. And we are actually working on an editor when you can just drag and drop all these components and it will generate a schema for you and then you can use that thing. You know, writing that manually is a little bit painful. I definitely agree with that but it will still take away the necessity of, manage, of you know, manage, managing the state on your own. Right. That, but yes, the editor is going to be included very soon. We actually have a working example in the cloud services. We just need to flesh out some you know, mind bugs. Basically, the other, the other things for managing the state and generating the components is just the implementation of how you are going to construct it. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So the comment from the audience was that they see the main benefit that you have some functions which will generate the schema for you. And that is exactly the case for the wizard that you saw. Like writing that schema manually would be insane. There's like 50 different fields and it branches and all the paths go around. What we do there, we are you know, fetching all of these partials from server and then we use these functions to create the schema, you know, to kind of bond it all together. And then you can render that you know, fairly complex form, if you ask me. Another question? Nope. Well, I guess that's it. So it was great talking to you, and I hope you liked it. I hope you will try that library, and if not, I will hope you that whenever you need to write some you know, generated UI, you will remember that sometimes the backend technologies are not enough, even though that your team is going to try you tell otherwise. <laughs>
and thank you for your attention and it was a pleasure speaking to you.